welcome to the Prigya Arora show where we discuss law and entrepreneurship with people who have been there and done that. My name is Prigya Arora, founder of PA Legal, an intellectual property law firm in India. And our guest for today is a very notable entertainment lawyer, Joshua Lastin. Welcome Joshua on the show. Hey everybody, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Perfect, Joshua. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And we'll start with your life story and how did you become the person you are today? Yeah, no, of course. I have a pretty interesting background and in, by way of coming to Hollywood. <clears throat> you know, I'm from a small town in America, maybe not more than 500 people, originally uh, a farming community. Um, but I was always enamored with movies. I was always in love with movies and television. Um, and I always knew growing up as a little kid that I wanted to move to Hollywood and be involved in some sort of way um, with the creative arts. You know, growing up as a kid, watching movies, what was really interesting and exciting to me was, was how the films got made wow. and how the practical effects, how physically they made the set pieces and the props. And if you think of Star Wars, like the spaceships and everything that they did, that was all very exciting and very interesting to me. And then as visual effect, as VFX started to become more prolific, as CGI started to become more and more a thing within TV and film, um, that also captured my attention. And I knew that I had to be somehow involved in the creative uh, TV and filmmaking process, but I didn't want to be a creative myself. I never wanted to be an actor um, or a writer or, or, you know, the one specifically hands-on making this stuff. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be able to support uh, artists. Um, growing up, I was also very entrepreneurial. Um, I knew I wanted to get into law, into history, into the social sciences. So I figured out a way to kind of marry those interests um, and combine both passions, both, you know, on the law, business, analytical side, and on the creative entertainment Hollywood side, um, the, the career path that I chose really allowed me to do both. So um, I came to Hollywood in 2011. Um, I didn't know a single person in the entire state of California, um, but I went and I started meeting people. I started taking meetings, started getting coffee and lunches and dinners. Um, and sure enough, I was able to get a, a unpaid internship at the time, but an intern nonetheless um, at American Idol, working on uh, music licensing for, for the television show American Idol um, back in 2011. Um, from there, I was able to do a lot of really cool internships on the entertainment, mostly film and TV side. Um, of note, you know, one of the cool things I got to work on when I was in law school was uh, I was at Marvel Studios and I got to work on Avengers Age of Ultron and I got to work on uh, uh, drafting and negotiating the visual effects deal or the VFX deal for the uh, Iron Man Hulkbuster armor, the molds and models and CGI that would eventually go on screen, right? Like there has to be a contract for that between the studio, between Marvel um, and the technicians, the VFX producing company, the mm -hmm. artists on that side, um, a contract has to be negotiated. So, so early on, you know, in my career, I was negotiating technology, VFX deals, service as a software agreement, um, as it relates to their incorporation and implementation into to TV and film. So in a, in a long-winded, long way of, of saying, you know, this is just kind of my way of marrying my interests between law, technology, science, and entertainment. Wow. Uh, Joshua, this is so interesting uh, because these uh, people consider these as you know diverse in, uh, industries and they do not think that merging of them is possible if you go to a lawyer a traditional lawyer they'll give you some advice but they'll not understand the industry very very properly so to to work with an industry i think it's very important to be a part of it and understand whole working of that industry then only we are able to advise them properly 
Yeah, it really helps to be a fan and to really kind of be in the know on on the latest, most cutting edge form of, of entertainment. Um, and I would say that technology and entertainment have always gone hand in hand, you know, as as cameras were invented, as yeah. uh, filmmaking, photography, videography, you know, have come about and now into the advent of AR, VR, NFTs, the metaverse. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a lot of interesting clients that come through my office that have good ideas for for how to utilize technology um, and and in use that in the art of storytelling. So it is important for me to constantly stay in the know. Um, I watch a lot of YouTube um, as it relates to science, technology, and entertainment. But yeah, all of that makes me a lot more versatile and able for me to con converse with my clients if they have an idea for a NFT-based comic book. Um, yeah. I can understand and marry those two interests um, and, and help get that accomplished for my client. Wow. So Joshua, uh, you know, you just told that you started in 2011 and we are here in 2023. Over the years, how do you think the entertainment industries has changed? Why? Because, you know, traditional filmmaking, then VFX, then social media, YouTube, TikTok, and now AI, NFTs, and lot of uh, metaverse and lot of new technologies coming up. So I'm sure you have seen whole landscape of entertainment industry changing. So can you tell us something about the changes happening in the industry? Oh, gosh, things have changed so much since I started in 2011. You know, YouTube was just kind of starting to take off and become a big thing at the time. Now is probably the number one place where I consume content um, in terms of my day to day, you know, watching of stuff. I watch a lot of YouTube and I watch a lot less film and TV than I ever have before. You know, it's great that they've kind of given outlets to to anyone who wants to be a content creator. Now, it doesn't matter where you are. You don't have to be in Hollywood. You don't have to be plugged into the, the studio system to be a content creator. Um, a lot of the YouTube channels that I watch are simple things from like toy collectors to, to history channel stuff. Um, and it's great now that like, uh, all of these smaller artists are able to exercise that kind of creativity from their basement and, and record and make content. Um, at the same time, it kind of creates sort of a um, uh, an attention economy, which is something that, you know, I think people are cognitive of as they use social media, uh, Instagram, TikTok, you know, all of these apps are fighting for our attention. Um, film and TV is becoming much less of a, a part of our entertainment consumption in the day to day. Um, and that's causing a lot of shifts and changes within the entertainment industry itself. Um, you know, right now in Hollywood, we have two giant union strikes. Um, currently happening. The Writers Guild of America, which represents all of the screenwriters for film and television in the United States, um, and then the Screen Actors Guild, SAG, um, is on strike representing the, the actors um, across TV and film. And a lot of the concerns that uh, the, the, al the actors or the writers are facing and the concerns that the talent are facing is the fact that the entertainment is, is starting to lose some of its value. So they're not being paid appropriately uh, as it relates to inflation, as it relates to post-COVID living. Um, and now, you know, looking on the horizon and even more changes within entertainment is, you know, mm -hmm. how does AI um, artificial intelligence impact entertainment. That's probably one of the driving concerns of this of this strike by both the Writers Guild mm -hmm. and the Actors Guild um, is that both are kind of in fear that that their jobs may someday be replaced with AI. Um, so so that is a, a legitimate concern and something that you know I'd love to talk about some more. Correct. So as you just spoke about AI and, you know, it's an it's a discussion which is going on throughout the world. Like if AI creates something, how does copyright law protect that? Who is the owner of it? And if we have an owner, how do we license it? 
uh, what is the organization who is the owner of that copyright where will the money go how will we negotiate contracts related to uh, you know anything which is generated by ai i think these are some important concerns so would you like to take up anything uh, about it yeah you know the great i will say there are a lot of benefits to ai in that like again i it, i feel like it democratizes creativity allows people to be more creative like you know i don't have coding skills uh but now i can generate images using mid-journey that would rival that of a digital artist right and so that's kind of great in that it, it allows someone who who isn't an artist to generate their own art quicker easier cheaper in a way that's never been done before um taking that art and making it copyrightably protectable shouldn't be too difficult. The, the, the caveat being that there hasn't been that many cases, at least here in the United mm -hmm. States, to challenge the copyright validity of AI work. But, but generally speaking, an original work of authorship that's fixed in a tangible medium should have some level of copyright protection, at least here in the United States. Yes. So if you generate a, a piece of work with AI, take it and redo it as your own or modify it in some particular way, in theory, that new piece, new work of art should have some sort of copyright protection. Um, to date, I, I don't know that, you know, sort of the amalgamation of images, the sort of generation of, of thousands or millions of random images combined into one image for AI, I don't think that that has yet been ruled as, as copyright infringement. Um, to me, in my personal opinion, and we get into all the long and boring legal details, mm -hmm. to me, that really sounds like a transformative use of 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 copyrightable images so so as far as using ai to generate your own works of art to the extent they are truly original i don't think people are going to have a problem finding copyright protection um and 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 you know finding ways to monetize it right they'll have the same challenge that any entrepreneur has in in creating a brand and creating brand influence and creating awareness um, I think all of those things remain true. What I think the the real sort of existential threat or re, uh, real sort of, um, you know, challenge for mankind is, is how does it relate to our ability to, to fake generate um, individuals, uh, deep fake. Um, I don't know if you've seen kind of the, the deep fake um, TikTok Jen Ortega or yeah. deep fake TikTok Tom Cruise or Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio. You know, um, those are kind of extreme examples, right, of high profile celebrities who are having their image kind of repurposed mm -hmm. and misappropriated um, for those high profile stars. Uh, at least in California, there's a right of publicity, a, a right of misappropriation of one's likeness. But in the United States, there isn't a federal or nationwide right of likeness. Oh. Um, if someone were to take yours or my image, if we've consented on it for, for usage once, we could theoretically uh, agree to that usage yeah. in perpetuity forever as an AI image. And so that, that is really what the actors are fighting against, you know, is because if they, if they take one background actor, scan him once, yes. and then are able to use that image in perpetuity forever for whatever they want, that really, you know, takes out a whole entire industry of workers. That is. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of the large concern that people are having with AI, at least um, here in the United States and in Hollywood, is what kind of protections are going to be in place for, for uh, individuals to not have their likeness taken from them, used in perpetuity, and not have their jobs replaced. Um, how do we stop um, AI from replacing writers in the writer's room um, and, and so that there are those jobs in the future. I know, Joshua, this is one of the concern. And, you know, uh, another concern which I believe is uh, very important to address is privacy and 
the infringement which is happening because of usage of these things. I think there are scams going, for example, people will take my photograph, generate an AI image and ask people for money and people will give because they'll say, uh, think Prigya is in trouble. And this has been happening on social media at a very, very massive rate. And even cyber security cells of various countries are, ha are facing difficulty in managing them. So I don't know how industry is going to <laughs> address all of these things. Yeah, you know, it's going to have to be a dual effort. The um definitely the law has to catch up to where the technology is because I don't think that there are laws that kind of essentially cover these areas. You know, um, I, I teach at a film school and we have this discussion often. Fraud is the intentional deception of another person. But what happens when you're not trying to intentionally deceive? What if you are affirmatively saying, you know, this is fake Tom Cruise or this is fake Michael Jackson? Well, you're you're not intentionally trying to deceive anyone. You let it out to the public know that this is fake. Um, um, but does that allow you the right to misappropriate these people's likenesses? So, so no. So the law has to really kind of catch up to those things. And then and cyber law in general has to uh, be able to kind of come down hard on those criminals mm -hmm. that are committing, you know, uh, willful fraud. Um, and, and technology has to help the law kind of catch up there because I don't know exactly how you go about, you know, kind of catching those type of criminals. Yeah. And Joshua, again, you know, because the content is develop, being developed at a very, very massive rate on the basically the social media platform, because anybody can just uh, shoot a movie, post a content the way we are doing this podcast. So are there certain concerns people should take care of? Because sometimes people are not aware uh, of their rights. People are not aware how platforms like YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram, how they are going to use their material, whether the copyright will go to these platforms or will it be still with, with the owner or the author of the creative work. So these are, I think, certain con uh, things which people are not aware of. So can you tell us certain measures that people can take while posting their things online? Yeah, so at least in the United States, copyright protection begins when an original work of authorship is fixed in a tangible medium. Got it. So the second you hit click on a camera, the second you hit play on your iPhone, that starts to create the components of a legal copyright here in the United States. So, so one thing that I guess that I would advise in order to maintain full ownership of your creative work is instead of posting, you know, sort of directly into the apps, record it with your phone or record it on another medium. So that way you have a kind of proof of ownership um, as you kind of disperse and distribute those things to the world. Um, that being said, everyone should kind of be aware that the second you load something onto the internet, um, it, it does kind of create an open door for people to steal, misappropriate, download, or figure out how to backdoor, you know, uh, find, find the code, I guess, um, um, to whatever it is that you've uploaded. So it kind of uses it as your own risk. Um, you can try to persecute those who have committed blatant copyright infringement. The burden is on you to find an attorney and go out and bring the lawsuit, which is can be very costly. Something that a lot of people don't know, however, is that most of the social media websites have a takedown function mm -hmm. or have a takedown option where you can write to the app itself um, there's a legal department within TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, and you can say, my work is being misappropriated. My work is being, you know, infringed by X and Y and Z user um, and try to remedy the things yourself. Um, yeah. uh, that's probably the best kept secret is that the, the average person does have recourse, at least as it relates to finding the culprits online and trying to take matters in their own hand. Um, but if, if there is non-compliance or if you don't get a response from the, the app or the company, um, you may have to escalate things to, to an attorney. Um, 
So, uh, Joshua, like I said, you know, these uh, platforms have an open right whenever they have uh, the receiver take down notice. Uh, it's the authority is with either YouTube or Instagram or Facebook to the platforms. So it's like platforms are uh, trying to take care of law in their hands. But sometimes a lot of people misuse this right as well. For example, they'll send irrelevant notices to many, many people in order to shut down their Facebook pages. And we have seen it happening at a massive stage. So is there any legal remedies for people uh, that people can take when they are facing these kind of irrelevant uh, takedown notices? As, as far as I'm aware, there isn't any sort of liability or criminal recourse for okay. for filing a false claim, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's on TikTok or YouTube or Instagram. Um, I think that, you know, th there's always the option that those apps can do an investigation and try to ban the person that tried okay. to ban <laughs> the the, the yes. person wrongfully um here in california we have laws that are kind of similar we have what we know as anti-slap laws or essentially laws that say hey if you bring a frivolous lawsuit against someone in order to stifle the right of freedom of speech then that person can sue you in recourse wow. for paying the costs of, of going through that wrongful lawsuit to begin with. Um, but I don't think that that extends in any way to the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. It would really be ultimately up to the, the, the apps themselves, the companies, the, the nannies, if you will, <laughs> of the apps to, to come down and say someone is violating or misusing yeah. that right. Because, because, because it is a privilege that they, you know, offer, um, the, the people an ability to reach out to the app and say someone is infringing. If that's being misused, there should be recourse against them. But I don't think, I don't know that there's legal recourse. Yeah, I know. I know these concerns do not have a right or wrong answer because th that's why they are concerns of the modern world. <laughs> You know, I see a lot of Instagram accounts because I represent a lot of models and a lot of yeah. influencers. They get shut down um, because people misreport their their accounts, um, and it's unfortunate. We try to go I mean, and ask, you know, the, the companies to reinstate them. Sometimes they will. Um, other times they're forced to just kind of start back at ground zero, which 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 sucks. But um, I'm sure someone will create technology that will allow you to to get all of your followers back. Um, yes. If you're deleted, but but I don't I don't know that technology yet. <laughs> yeah, I I have seen ha ha it happening like major people with a lot of followers on Facebook. Their pages they just uh, vanish within a day, and the whole business gets sh gets shut down because the platform are taking care of everything, and the law is in their hands. Yeah, you know, they're private corporations, they're private yeah. platforms. When you're signing up to use um, their service as a software, you are agreeing to play by their rules, um, and they're going to have probably the ultimate authority, uh, the final say on when or when not to shut down an account um, mm -hmm. until the law kind of initiates some sort of internet bill of rights or some <laughs> sort of fundamental <laughs> rights of the internet. Um, you can't be banned, you know, from yes. platforms or whatever. Um, you know, the Donald Trumps of the world will always be in, mm -hmm. in fear of being kicked off of a platform if they say something, you know, not not appropriate or, or mm -hmm. unlawful, I guess. Yeah. So, Joshua, one last question around a law and then we'll come with our quick rapid fire round. So the thing okay. is, we, we spoke a lot about negotiating contracts and uh, related to music law and film industry because this is a very creative field can you give us example of some specific clauses that needs to be there in the nego while that that needs to be taken care of while negotiating and that ultimately goes into the contract yeah you know i would say all of the standard clauses for for a contract in terms of like what are your fees what are the expectations of the services between the party um credit on the creative project is always a huge sticking point who's getting what credit where does it the credit appear whose name appears first 
how big the credit is. Um, always a contestable issue when we're negotiating big Hollywood deals. Um, something interesting that I always have to negotiate or that I always put into my legal contracts for entertainment is something called a waiver of injunctive relief. Mm -hmm. It's a clause in a contract that essentially states, you know, we we have the right to essentially sue each other for money damages. Uh, if this, something goes bad, the contract goes bad sometime later on down the road. If there's a dispute between the parties, we have the recourse of of suing each other for money. But at no point will you sue the producer in order to stop the creative project mm -hmm. to enjoin file an injunction, a restraining order, or in any way kind of uh, prevent the release of the entertainment project, because ultimately that's going to be the money that's used to, you know, mm -hmm. pay back any sort of wrongdoing uh, or, or breach of contract. So every single one of the contracts that I draft has this waiver of injunctive relief stating, hey, producer might be in breach and you can sue the producer as you would for a breach of contract but the most you're going to get is money and you're not going to be able to get an injunction or a stop on a film tv show or song well uh, this is very very interesting because i think this is one of the important clause otherwise whole production may get stopped or film releases they become because generally disputes like these happen at a later at later stages and the whole for example 10 days before the release day some di dispute happened and there is an injunctive relief so that that ultimately stops everyone from everything so i think that yeah, is a very, very important clause I would say it's very important, especially for, for international um, clients. I have a few international clients that I'm working with right now that, you know, the, the their creative game app developers or they created comic books in another country um, and in studios in the United States want to take their IP, take their intellectual property and develop it for TV and film. But when we go and look at the contracts that they use to create that work of art, if it doesn't contain a waiver of injunctive relief, the studios might not want to proceed forward with developing the idea. Yeah. So, so as it relates to technology, creative developers that are kind of in the intersection of that space and the international level, making sure that all of your contracts have a work for hire provision and a waiver of injunctive relief. This is going to be very important for later adapting that IP, that intellectual property for yeah. TV or film. Perfect. Very well said, Joshua. And I think everybody working in this field should make a note of these two provisions and include them in their contracts. So, or, the, or just call my office and we'll do it for you. <laughs> yes, you can call Joshua's office and he'll be happy to help you. So Joshua, now we'll come to a quick rapid fire round. Answer these three questions very, very quickly. Three things okay. we are grateful for. Three things that I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for my career. Um, I love my career. I love what I do. Um, I love being able to live in Los Angeles. Um, and I, I love my wife and dog. So it, that's four things, but we'll lump the dog and wife together. <laughs> two traits that you think are useful for an innovator. Yeah, two traits that are useful for an innovator. Obviously, creativity. Um, you know, I, I think that creativity is the skill that one can develop. It's not something that just people are innately born with. It's something that's developed over time exercising your creative skills, going on, you know, sort of creative mind walks, creating mind maps, and, and, and now, you know, brainstorming using the technology and the AI that we have available, exercising those creative muscles are very important. Um, and, you know, I, I think it just in general, good listening skills are important yeah. for anybody. Um, it's really powerful to to listen um, in a world where there's so much talking and, and everyone wants to have the final say to be the one to listen and understand kind of makes you the most powerful person in the room. Perfect. Creativity and listening skills. And now the last one is one aspiration you have for the future. One aspiration that I have for the future, uh, I hope to grow and expand my law firm. You know, we're, we're an office now in Beverly Hills, uh, California, right outside of Hollywood. 
but we have ambitions of opening offices in potentially Las Vegas or Miami. Um, we do, you know, a lot of film and TV work right now, but we'd also do a lot of work in animation. Um, and we're starting to get more clients in visual effects, AR, VR, NFTs. And, and I hope the proliferation of entertainment kind of um, encapsulates all of these things. Someday I hope to see a world where we're riding VR roller coasters and listening to, you know, EDM music and, and, and watching Circus Soleil <laughs> all at the same time. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm excited to see what entertainment and technology will be able to produce in the future. Perfect. So, Joshua, would you, I think that this is a very good aspiration and, yeah, co again, combining a lot of industries together and getting a lot of work. <laughs> that sound, sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah, it would be cool. <laughs> yeah. So, Joshua, uh, would you like to share some key takeaways uh, with our audience, like any key takeaways that you want to share with our audience? Yeah, you know, I would just say probably one of the most important things that is, in my life, in my career that makes me successful is is my ability to network, my ability to go out there and meet people. Um, I think I alluded or mentioned earlier that when I moved to Hollywood, I didn't know anybody, um, but I got the phone number of my aunt's ex-husband's boss's wife's sister's kid um, mm -hmm. who was an entertainment lawyer here in LA and by getting that phone number that got me my first meeting and my mm -hmm. first intro into the door and it was really spending you know the last 10 11 years of, of building connections building relationships um, getting to know my peers and building a community in what it is that I want to do that has allowed me to become very successful. So, so you know, you can find your community um, as it relates to, to your work and your passion. Um, and, and I think that that is a number one driver for a, not only a successful career, but a happy career. Wow, perfect. I think community is so important because then everybody supports you in your path. And it's absolutely important for any person uh, who wants to pursue any career or any profession so joshua thank you so much for your time and thank you for being on the show and i look forward to seeing you again sometime thank you thank you audience for having me i really appreciate it hey there thank you for attending today's session if you enjoyed the session do follow our channel and consider sharing it with a friend my name is prigya arora daughter of inspiring parents alumna of iit khadakpur engineer turned lawyer and entrepreneur and now founder of pa legal where we help creators and innovators protect their intellectual property thank you